Welcome to the tools session, everybody. Uh, I know the program has been changed a lot for certain reasons, but we're starting with a presentation of Lambeck, and Ian is going to tell us uh, what it is. Lambeck, I'm not going to name all the names. It's, uh, it's like 12 names on the paper or something like that, but it's something that has been developed by Continuum. Okay. Well, um, so I've had a lot of... We have a lot of theory so far, so, but I'm going to start off this, uh, this, this little break from, this, from the theory um, by doing uh, a live uh, coding demonstration um, of Lambeck, um, which is a tool we've been developing at Continuum to help us um, perform quantum natural language experiments um, without needing a PhD. Um, <clears throat> so Lambeck allows us to implement um, a QNLP pipeline which um, just to spell it out, you start off with a corpus of sentences and as, as input, and then you encode them as diagrams. Um, and then you rewrite, you perform some rewriting and then you uh, parameterize them. Um, and then you train, and then you train the parameters, uh, optimize them uh, for your experiment. <clears throat> so if we start at the very beginning, and look at diagram encoding, Lambic supports multiple computational models, which turn sentences into string diagrams. Uh, for example, we have um, the spiders reader, which um, composes uh, the words in a sentence using a spider. And to demonstrate, I will just uh, demonstrate on this sentence, uh, fat cats eat rats. Um, and as you can see, um, it joins all the words with a spider, and since spider is a commutative operation, um, this loses information about the ordering of the words in the sentence. So this gives you a so-called bag of words model. Um, on the other hand, we can have um, we can use a, a word sequence model such as the stairs reader. Um, the API is exactly the same, um, which you just turn a sentence into a diagram. I'll use the same uh, sentence to demonstrate. And as you can see, it composes the words from left to right using um, a special stair box that you can then um, customize uh, its behavior uh, when you parameterize. Um, if you want to be even more sophisticated, we can also consider the grammar of the sentence uh, by using the disco cat model um, developed by Bob and, and some other men, and Manush and, and Steve, um, <clears throat> which composes the words in the sentence according to a pass in a pre group grammar. Uh, to demonstrate how this works without going into the weeds of all the theory, um, I'll use the uh, Python library, library DiscoPy, um, which allows us to, which is the um, the Python library that Lambic uses under the hood to kind of represent and manipulate string diagrams. So DiscoPy allows us to um, define words with specific type. So for example, we can define the noun type, and then we can say that the word cat is a word um, we're of noun type. And if we have a look, um, this is what it looks like in DiscoPy. It's just a state in the um, monoidal category. Uh, we can say the same for the word uh, rats. And then to define the word uh, eat, uh, we need a sentence type because that's the eventual output of our, set, um, of our uh, diagram. And then we just define eat as a word. Um, that takes in a noun from uh, the left and the right to give us a noun from, uh, to give us a sentence. Um, and then if we look at what, and then we can compose the um, words together and we see that that's what it looks like. Um, so that's the meaning of the words separately. And then we can um, compose them in the grammar, uh, in the pre group grammar by using, um, by using cups to join them together. So We'll, we'll join if we join these wires um, and these wires. Um, whoops. Um, we can see that um, we have a um, we have the uh, meaning of the sentence um, according to um, the the words and how they join in the pre group grammar using these cups. Um, <clears throat> because disco cat um, the disco cat model uh, corresponds to a pre group class. We can extend it easily. Uh, for example, we can define an adjective type, um, maybe for the word fat, as something that uh, takes in a noun from the right and gives you um, gives you a noun. And then we can and then we can um, um, define um, a lot of other more complex types as well. As well. 
Um, however, you can see that we had to specify the grammar uh, manually for um, the sentence that go above, and that would be extremely um, tedious to have to do for every single sentence that we provide in. Um, <clears throat> but as I said before, Lambic supports uh, DiscoCam, and we use a um, state-of-the-art parser uh, called uh, Bobcat, uh, which can automatically parse sentences and turn them into uh, diagrams according to the DiscoCam model. So all we need to do is instantiate it, and then we can ask Bobcat to turn a sentence into a diagram, such as, uh, such as this one. And then we can see it automatically works out what the grammar of the sentence is and joins uh, together the means in the sentence uh, for it. So it's quite, it's very straightforward to, um, to um, um, use this to general, uh, to pass the entire corpus. So if I um, <clears throat> open up this uh, file, which has a list of sentences in it, um, then all you need to do is say you ask Bobcat to um, pass multiple sentences um, um, by turning the file into a list. And then um, if I just add this to stop it from um, causing any problems, then it will just go ahead and um, pass all the sentences and turn them into diagrams view. So this is passing a 1,000 sentence, 1,000 um, sentence corpus. It's a bit slow because um, it has to do on CPU right now, but I will just um, pass a little subset of it for you um, to demonstrate uh, because I want to show you that Bobcat um, is uh, very powerful because uh, it is able to just um, pass very, uh, very long sentences without any problems. So I'll just draw out one of the diagrams to show you. Um, and this um, sentence has um, 30 words in it. And it just is able to work out the right path for it. As you can see on the right here, there's also swaps in the diagram. This isn't um, a feature that you'd normally find in pre-group grammars, but that's because we use a slightly more powerful um, grammar called combinatory categorical grammars or CCGs. And this lets us just handle a wider range of sentences that we could normally do with just pre-groups. All right. So after you've turned the sentences as diagrams, uh, you want to use it in an experiment, right? So in order to do that, we turn the diagram into um, a circuit to run on that can run on quantum hardware. Uh, you can do that very simply in Lambeck. Um, and I'll demonstrate by using the same um, diagram that we had uh, above. Um, and we will turn it into a sentence using um, an IQP ANSATS. So the first thing we need to do is just to reassign the types to the ones used by the um, parser. And then we just um, in, uh, create the ansatz. Um, the way we do that is we have to specify a mapping of each uh, type in the sentence to some number of qubits that you want it, uh, that you want it represented in the output. So we could say one qubit for nouns, two for sentences, and then we specify the number of um, layers of, of Hadamard gates and unitaries in the, in the, in the ansatz. Um, so you could just have one here. And then once you've done that, it's just as simple as apl um, applying the ansatz to the diagram. Uh, for fun, I'll show you what it looks like when you convert it into ticket form. Um, so here's the circuit. And then you can just easily customize it. You can say, you know, something crazy, like you want four qubits for a noun, and it'll just do that for you, or you want like like nine layers or something. Um, and it might, there you go. And it just works. Let's see. And that's very, it's very simple to customize that with Lambeck and very powerful, obviously. And here you can see that the parameters of the, um, each box in the circuit is currently displayed symbolically. Um, but I'll show you um, uh, shortly how we can use Lambeck to substitute some concrete parameters so that you can evaluate the circuit and get an actual um, value out of it. Uh, but first, um, I just want to demonstrate that you can not only run quantum experiments um, using Lambeck, but, you, but we also have tools for running uh, classical experiments using tensor networks, uh, which can be created using uh, the tensor ansatz. Um, and here you have to, um, here each word becomes a tensor and you have to specify um, the number of dimensions uh, for each type. So you might say that this is the tensor ansatz. Uh, and now it becomes uh, a dimension of size two and the sentence becomes um, dimension of size three. 
in the tensor network. And then the same, you do the same thing. You just apply the answer to the diagram and then you get a tensor network out. Right. Um, so now what we have to do to evaluate the diagram to specify some concrete parameters. Uh, however, at this point we can start running into uh, some problems. I'll demonstrate with another uh, sentence. Um, that is uh, cats eat rats on mats. And then you can see that the word um, that the word on, if we convert this um, into uh, a tensor diag a tensor network using the same ancestors as we done did above, um, that the word on becomes a five dimensional tensor and a number of elements we need to specify it grows exponentially. Um, in order to uh, combat this, Lambeck also includes a rewriting module, which allows you to specify some rewrite rules on the diagram. Um, these kind of, these rules express a sort of prior assumption about certain word interactions um, with the idea that they simplify the representation of words in your final diagram and therefore um, reduce resource usage. So the way we apply them is to use the rewriter class in Lambeck. So we say, uh, we want to create a rewriter and then the rules we will um, use here. Um, I will use what's called the uh, prepositional prepositional phrase rule. Um, and I'll show you the effect it has on the diagram. Um, as you can see, um, it changes the word on. Um, it's, it, you have, it, has, it kind of passes the noun wires through, uh, noun wire through um, transparently. And so you can see that the word on has gone from being a five dimensional tensor to only becoming a three dimensional tensor. And this re reduces the number of elements in the, in the tensor very, dr um, very dramatically in the final in the final sentence. And for example, this also helps in quantum circuits because it'll say reduce the number of qubits that you have to use to represent to represent large words like this. All right. So before tackling the final step of the pipeline, that is um, training, I just want to mention that Lambeck also contains a command line interface, which can be used to perform the start, start of the pipeline. So let's just to remind ourselves of what the pipeline looked like. You start with sentences um, as input, and then it does some diagram encoding, some rewriting, some parameterization. So this is what I've shown you so far, and I'm about to go on and show you training. Um, and the, the, the CLI um, is very helpful because it allows you to perform um, all of these um, steps at the beginning, which, it make, which means that you can prepare a corpus um, of sentences um, into a, you know, a corpus of, of diagrams and circuits that you can then um, save onto your computer before using, using it to perform training. Because you might want, because you might be using the same um, diagrams for for multiple um, runs of training, for for example. So just to um, uh, demonstrate um, how you would use that, um, you would use the Lambeck um, command. I uh, just just ignore this bit at the beginning because that's just a bit of um, boilerplate that I have to add onto my command, um, and then. It's as simple as saying, what's your input file? So I'll use the same input file as I did before, uh, which is just um, um, a text file with a bunch of um, sentences in it. And then you say, how do you want to um, turn this into diagrams or circuits? So you can specify what ANSATs you want to use. Um, you, can specify, you can also specify some ANSATs options um, in order to customize the way the ANSATs work. Um, I need to add some backslashes to help it. Continue and then you say, oh, what's the output format um, of of the of this corpus um, to save onto disk? Um, here we use the pickle format because it's easy to use that to save and load data um, in Python. And then we'll say we want to save all of these circuits into a uh, file called circuits.pickle. Um, and then um, it will just start up and then it should be going here. So it does exactly the same thing as above where it will pass all the sentences and then turn them into circuits. Again, since this is being a bit slow, I will just, um, I'll stop this for now and continue on um, the next uh, step of the talk, which is um, to demonstrate how you can use the command line interface to also just um, as, as, a, as a little tool to help you uh, view um, diagrams in the terminal. So you'd say you just you just pass it a sentence, 
and then um, it will show you the, the pass for it in the terminal. Um, it just takes a little bit of time. And then there we go, see? So you can use that to sort of just look at, look at diagrams in your free time. Um, so after you've prepared the diagrams um, in, in a corpus, you can then use it for optimization using Lambex training module, which I'll demonstrate here. Um, I'll train a little task that I prepared earlier. And just to mention that um, there's a little a more in-depth version of this task, um, which is available to you on the Lambex documentation, which I'll just type here. Um, so you just have a reference of future. Right, in order to do this, uh, um, this task, I will load the data I prepared earlier. So this is the relative pronoun task, um, which is a task to, uh, let me just load this. So this loads, so this has the training data and the, um, testing data. Right. So this uh, predicts whether a noun phrase contains a subject-based relative clause, uh, such as this diagram, or whether it's an object-based relative clause, such as, such as this diagram. The first thing we need to do with training is to convert the diagram into circuits. Uh, but before that, we will, rem we will uh, remove the cups in the diagram, which reduces the effect of post-selection. I'll just show you what that looks like here. Um, so there we go. So there's no post. So then uh, that that reduces um, the post selection effect that you get from cups. So in order to turn this into circuits, I will use um, an IQP ANSATS as we did uh, as I showed before. Um, we will represent nouns using one qubit systems, and then we will discard all the sentence wires. Uh, because we don't really need them. Um, and then we'll use one layer. So I'll just um, create the circuits. And then if I copy this, um, we will do the same for, um, for the evaluation data as well. There we go. Um, right. And so just to show you what a circuit looks like, um, I'll draw it out for you so you have an idea. So this is what we're going to be um, sit, um, evaluating. Right, we'll then create a model which manages the parameters for optimization. Um, to do that, we'll use the so-called NumPy model, which is uh, the one that I guess you want to use most of the most of the time, um, unless you have a specific reason for using another one. So we'll say this is a NumPy model, um, and then we're going to create it from the diagrams um, we have in our corpus, and we'll automatically extract all of the um, parameters from the circuits um, and then uh, manage them. Then we'll create a trainer which handles the optimization of the model parameters. Uh, first, we will um, define a few ancillary um, functions. For example, we need to define a loss function. So here I'll use um, binary cross entropy loss. And then we will define an accuracy measure. Um, and then we need to divide by two because there's a double counting involved that we then need to correct for. And then we, um, we um, create a trainer. So here we want to use um, the so-called quantum trainer um, and then we also need to import the optimizer, which here we will use SPSA. Um, and then we'll create the trainer. We will say it's a quantum trainer. We'll give it the model that we created just beforehand. We'll say the loss function is the binary cross entropy loss that we um, defined just now. We'll run it for 100 epochs. 
we will um, um, say that the optimizer we're using is the SPSA optimizer that we just um, imported. And then we will give it some high, we'll give the SPSA optimizer some hyperparameters. Um, I will just use some ones that we found is uh, are pretty good. Uh, same ones that I used on the um, the more in-depth tutorial that's in the documentation. Um, and then we'll give it some functions for evaluation. We will use we'll, we will use the um, accuracy measure that we defined above. So we'll say we'll have this, and then we'll give it a um, random seed. So we'll use this. We'll just say forty two. Um, and then we will need to create a data set for both the training and the evaluation uh, corpus using a data set class. And that manage that just manages um, the, the matching of the circuits with the labels for us. And we say it's a data set where we give it um, the circuits and then we give it the labels. And then we have the evaluation data set as well, which does the same thing. And then it will serve up the it will serve up the um, circuits and labels for us. It can, you can also use it to do some batching as well, uh, which is also very helpful. And then after that, we can just say we can just ask the trainer to start optimizing, given the training data set, the evaluation data set, and we will ask it to log every ten steps for us. And I oh, see I misdefined uh, it right. And then that should just start running. And then once it will done, once that's done, it will have the, um, the your model will have the um, optimized parameters in it. So just to finish off our talk, um, I'll, I'll just um, tell you how to you know uh, find 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 us. So um, it's very easy to start using Lambda and play around with it. All we need to do is um, if you have Python, you just say you just um, use pip to install Lambda. Um, the PyPy link uh, is here. Uh, um, you can see our documentation uh, here. And then you can obviously, um, Lambic is all open source, so you can find us on GitHub uh, at this location. Um, and that's it. Um, many thanks to you know all of the collaborators on the project, and I'll welcome any questions anyone has. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. I guess you can ask and I can repeat the question. <laughs> okay, so the, the question was, why did the training accuracy go down and then go up? <laughs> so my answer is that training is difficult. Um, so the question is, how does uh, what we have at the moment compare to like what the kind of NLP you can perform classically? Yeah, it's well, yeah, there's, there's still very much, you know, a lot of active research is going on. So um, obviously, we're not we're not quite at classical level yet. Uh, may, I think I think mainly we're kind of bottlenecked by how much data we can process um at once um but i mean we're actively you know um, trying out things in order to and trying running experiments in order to see um 
how, how we can do and where we can improve on things. Um, so the question is, yeah, yeah, so the question we're just asking what the tensor network here actually, what rep, like represents, is that, well, I mean, um, it's like tensor, so the order is compacted, so the order is up to the object. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's just a tensor network, yeah. it's, it's not. It's, it's nothing like it's, special it's, about it, I guess. It's put together. Yeah. It, it, it's just a diagram, really. It means a diagram which interpreted with vector space in a linear map, nothing else. The thing you have been doing and didn't work because the hardware was not big enough. Yeah. It's the same thing, I guess. There's nothing special about it or different. Yeah. No more questions? Ah, Ross? Yeah. Um, so you're talking about this, right? The rewrite rules. Um, so you, you kind of have to manually specify, like we, like we have to, we have to specifically say to, to, um, to, to spell out what the rewrite rule is. Um, so in that case, in, in that sense, it, it doesn't generalize in a sense of automatically finding good rewrite rules. You still have to specify them manually. I mean, I mean, it's also the sort of thing for like with relative pronouns, the rare natural choices, and you can kind of you get can show with experiments that it's a natural choice. Yeah. So, it's, so uh, the it's, it's going beyond grammar. It's giving more meaning inside these boxes. Yeah, and, and I guess um, the use of rewrite rules is also partly just. Um, just to reduce the reduce the resource usage. Otherwise, we couldn't run experiments at all. So we have to like specify. We have to find some way of um, reducing and reducing it. Okay. We thank Ian again. So now we go to the. We move from Oxford to, uh, to, to Gdansk in Poland. We're going to listen to Bellen give a talk about an open source linear program for testing yeah, yeah. classical explainability of a GPT. Yeah. Okay, hello. Um, so, yeah, I first I want to say that I am very happy to be at a QPL uh, in presence. I think that uh, uh, we needed this after the pandemic. Uh, or, you know, after these two years of pandemic, so I am really happy. And um, now we are going to present you with the, well, this demo tool of uh, one of the things that we've been doing recently. So we're going to make this like a uh, really hybrid uh, to honor QPL. So first I'm going to give you a little bit of an explanation of what the problem is. And then Ellie, who is currently in Canada, is going to, uh, uh, tell you how to use uh, our uh, program. <clears throat> so um, here we have these uh, keywords, uh, which is classical explainability and GPT. So let me put maybe everyone up to speed <clears throat> on what those things mean. And what happened? There we go. <clears throat> so. Um, what is it that we're trying to do here? Where here we are asking the question of what is non-classicality or what is a like a particular way of capturing a classical a classic the classical aspect of experiments that we run in the lab, and we want to be able to tell failures of that notion of classicality that is defined or endorsed. So I will start with a particular notion of classicality, which is that of uh, generalized non-contextuality. And the failure of this is what then signals that there is some non-classicality happening in the experiment. So here, what we have is uh, we start from an operational theory. 
So what does an operational theory mean? Well, it means that we have a particular set of preparations that we can prepare a system in, and then we have a particular set of measurements that we can perform on that system. And, that, and what we are interested in studying at the end of the day are the statistical predictions that uh, we read out from this experiment, which is the probability that we obtain a particular outcome of uh, given that we have performed a particular uh, measurement and prepared the system according to a particular preparation procedure. And the question is, well, if we're in the lab, if we have these like uh, two uh, different ingredients of our operational theory and we observe these predictions, uh, when are these predictions classical or when can we say that they are compatible with the classical explanation of the underlying experiment? <clears throat> and oh, there we go. It's the other arrow that I need to press. And so we say that something is classical if it can be explained by a generalized non-contextual ontological model, which is, you know, there's lots of words there. So let me try to, you know, flesh it out a bit. So an ontological model, basically what we have is a set of, um, I lost my, there we go, there's the cursor. We have a set of ontic states, which, you know, somehow represent, you know, the possible physical states that the system can be in. And what we think of is that is basically all of the information is encoded there. So when we have a particular preparation of a system, then it's like having like a particular distribution of all of the, you know, probabilities of preparing our system in particular uh, ontic states, depending to the procedure that we are using. And then when we perform a measurement, basically the particular outcome of that measurement uh, will happen with a particular probability depending on the underlying ontic state. So uh, here, basically, this is a response function, and this is, you know, a conditional probability distribution that tells you your preparation. And at the end of the day, the probabilities that you observe in the lab are just, you know, um, just a statistical average over all of that. Now, that is just an ontological model. When do we say that such a model is generalized non-contextual? So we say that it's generalized non-contextual when um, certain the operational properties that we observe at the level of the operational theory also um, are also expected to uh, happen at the level of the underlying ontological model. So what does that mean? Well, for example, if we observe that two particular preparation procedures are operationally equivalent, which means that there is no way of distinguishing them uh, from the point of view of the measurements that we have access to, then that means that the underlying uh, uh, support or preparation uh, of the underlying uh, components in each of those ontic uh, states of the two different preparation procedures has to be the same. And similarly for the case of measurements, if we have two different measurement outcomes that we cannot distinguish operationally by any possible preparation of our system, then we want that to also be reflected or to somehow emerge from the underlying ontological model, namely that saying that the two response functions happen to be the same for the particular measurement outcome for um, any uh, ontological, uh, any ontic state. Mm -hmm. So this is a uh, the way that you know a physical way to motivate when an operational theory has an underlying classical explanation. Now the thing is that sometimes you know this is not uh, very easy to test in the lab, or you know sometimes there are uh, things going around this definition that are not easy to handle. So recently there has been a, a equivalent a notion of classicality that has been put forward, uh, which is not about operational theories, but about the generalized probabilistic theory that is associated to the operational theory. So for a GPT, then what we have or the ingredients that we have are the normalized states of your theory. You have the effects of your theory that correspond to measurement outcomes, unit effects, and also a bilinear map, which is the one that tells you uh, what are, how the probabilities are computed. So the predictions that I was mentioning before arise uh, just by saying, well, we have the particular GPT state associated to this preparation procedure, the particular GPT effect associated to this measurement outcome, and the probabilities of obtaining that are given by this bilinear map that defines this GPT. Now, when are these predictions classical? And I clicked the wrong arrow again. Well, that is when the GPT is simplex embeddable. 
So that was, what does this mean? Well, it means that I need to, there we go, scroll down, that the uh, set of normalized states can be embedded into a simplex and that the set of effects can be embedded into the dual of that simplex and that the probabilities are preserved by this joint embedding. So if I compute the probability of a particular state and effect, then that is the same as computing the probability of the associated ones after they have been embedded into the two different simplices. Mm -hmm. But of course, here we have a, you know, this is a way to check classicality or non-classicality of a full theory. And usually when we are in our lab, we don't really have a full theory to play with. We just have like, you know, some limited uh, access to states and effects and preparation for seizures. So what we focus on here is actually that. What happens when instead of looking at the full theory, we just look at the things that we have in our lab. So here, we, what, we, uh, what we study is what if I have a particular and arbitrary but fixed experiment. And in this experiment, we have a set of, a set of preparations, which are the preparations of our system. Uh, which is a possibly finite set. And here I'm abusing notation because I'm using omega and uh, E again. And then we also have the measurement outcomes of uh, all of our measurements that we have access to and that we want to perform in our own experiment, which is also a possibly finite set. And here the predictions that we observe are just the probabilities that we measure in our lab when we perform this experiment. And now the question is, when are these predictions classical? So I don't want to like, uh, I, I want to be able to just use that data, and not other stuff like, you know, in these more general definitions that I was mentioning before. And that is what our linear program is. So before we can go to the linear program, let me say a little bit more, what are the particular ingredients that we need in order to make this work? <clears throat> so basically, the first ingredient that we need is a definition of this of a particular linear map h omega so i'm not going to expect that you follow all of this but i just want you to kind of have an idea of how things run in the background so that when ellie is playing around with examples you can somehow see how things or have an idea of how things work so basically you start with this set of states the states that you have in your uh, experiment that you can prepare in your experiment and those actually live in a particular cone and what you do is you define this linear map that basically tests um, membership in this cone. So the way that you define it mathematically is a linear map that uh, when you apply it to a vector, it gives a vector of uh, all <clears throat> non-negative entries if and only if the original vector that you are evaluating belongs to this cone. And then the second ingredient that you need is this um, <clears throat> It's an inclusion map that we call I omega. And what is this inclusion map? Well, it might be that the uh, set of states that you start with that you have access in your experiment actually doesn't really span the whole full scope of states that that particular system could actually be prepared in. So this is, you know, some uh, in map that uh, takes the span of that particular set of states that you have access to and maps it into like this potentially larger dimension uh, state uh, of the full GPT. And this is, you know, something that I told you about for this uh, set omega, but you also need to define exactly the same thing for the set E of effects. And at the end of the day, then, uh, the, what the um, program does is that says, well, the predictions are classical if uh, you can find a matrix of non-negative entries such that this relation here is satisfied. Mm -hmm. So here we have only uh, matrices that are computed by the set of states and a set of effects that we have access to in our experiment. And the linear program basically checks if, this, if there's a way to satisfy this uh, mathematical relation. So that is all about uh, what I wanted to tell you. So here we have the set of preparations from our experiment, the set of outcomes or effects that we can implement in our mesh, uh, you know, uh, experimental setup. And here, like, we don't really have to compute any probabilities at all. Like our linear program just tells you if there is a particular way to try to combine this in order to observe non-classical statistics. Mm -hmm. So that's it. 
Now, uh, somehow Ellie is going to take over the floor or the screen and uh, play around with uh, examples and show you things. So how do I do that? <laughs> Technical team. <laughs> it's happened. Oh, perfect. Hello, Ellie. So uh, our code is in the form of a Mathematica notebook. Um, uh, we call it open source because although Mathematica is a proprietary system, uh, the actual code is available and you can sort of download the notebook and read it whether or not you can run Mathematica. So I understand some objections which says, is it really sort of free and open source? Maybe not, but it is technically open source. Um, uh, and uh, it requires also a little bit of external software to run, which is um, to find the facets of a uh, polytope cone. With this, we use CDD, so the user will need to also install CDD on their computer to use this. Uh, I have CDD uh, installed on my computer, but when you open up this notebook, the very first thing you see is um, uh, uh, a cell which can be modified to put in the location of this CDD binary, and CDD is a thing that's called by the main algorithm. So I'll go through a couple of examples of how it works. Um, uh, and I want to just emphasize that the main function uh, that you would call is this thing called discover embedding. Uh, and discover embedding will take a description of uh, your GPT and will try to determine whether or not it is simplex embedded. Um, uh, in the first example, let's imagine that um, we have a quantum case. Uh, so we want to consider sort of repeat quantum theory. Uh, or stabilizer quantum theory. So we're going to imagine that we have four possible preparations, um, plus and minus uh, in the Pauli Z, and plus and minus in another basis, let's say Pauli X or Pauli Y. Um, now, uh, in quantum theory, we represent the state as a density matrix, whereas in GPTs, we represent states as uh, uh, real value vectors. So there might be sort of a bit of ambiguity in terms of what to do here, but uh, our program takes care of all that. So if you specify these are the four states and effects which are available in your sort of read the GPT, uh, you can just call discover embedding, giving it this list, and it will automatically uh, proceed. And it'll say, oh, you've given me quantum input because you've given me a list of density matrices. So the first thing the program will do is it'll say, okay, we're going to give you now a GPT description. So here we have four states. So it looks like four states, every row of this matrix is a state, every row of this matrix is an effect, this is the unit effect, and you'll look at the unit effect as an inner product of one with every state in this list of states. Um, uh, we then realize that the way that we constructed this, um, uh, it technically is not an accessible GPT fragment because it doesn't have a full column rank, right? there's only sort of rank three with four columns. Uh, and so the code proceeds by automatically constructing an accessible GPT fragment of the following form. Um, and so now this is sort of a three columns and three columns. It basically just drops this column in this case um, uh, and recognizes that in principle, we could define a depolarizing map, um, which is a, a map that takes any state uh, from our list of states and converts it to a maximally mixed state. Um, uh, so the, the program will then proceed by asking, okay, given an accessible GPT fragment, is it embeddable? So if we have this sort of information, which is um, uh, the, uh, the, the accessible GPT states, the accessible GPT effects, these sort of inclusion matrices, um, uh, we proceed to find the facets of the uh, effect cone and the state cone. Um, and these are vectors which have non-negative inner products, if we're talking about the, uh, the state cone. So these would have uh, non-negative inner product with every state. And moreover, a state is only in this cone, meaning it can be expressed as a positive combination of these basis states, if and only if it has non-negative inner product with all four of these vectors. Um, and that's the definition of uh, the cone. It's kind of converting from uh, a basis of rays to uh, a bunch of inequality, which is fine to come. Uh, and this is where CD is employed, and I'll show you the code in a moment. Um, and then uh, we simply ask, can we fulfill sort of the main condition that uh, Belen wrote at the end, which is can we show that these sort of inner product of inclusion maps 
can be expressed as some uh, positive signal matrix uh, sandwiched in between these two uh, uh, matrices, which sort of uh, move everything to a sort of a non-negative representation. Uh, and in this case, the answer is yes. And I'll try to explain what the R is in a moment. Um, so let me just uh, back up and give you sort of a high level summary and then go through two more examples. Um, so what we're mainly dealing with is a, is a situation where you have these four things. Uh, you have the accessible GPT uh, states, the accessible GPT effects, and the two inclusion maps. Uh, and we want to know whether there is any sort of sigma matrix which makes this condition hold true. Um, in practice, we imagine that the user will not uh, provide these kind of inclusion maps, because why would you? Uh, and so we assume uh, that for all intents and purposes, discover embedding ex ecstasy just some GPT fragment. It doesn't have to be full column rank, some uh, uh, GPT effect thing, and everything is now automatically taken care of. Um, and furthermore, instead of just giving a yes, no answer, so is it or is it not simplex embeddable? Um, we ask how much noise would we have to introduce to this GPT to make it simplex embeddable? And this is the parameter we call R. So we end up describing it as sort of minimize a number R such that um, if we take uh, uh, this condition for simplex embeddability, we can sort of relax it. So we can have sort of one minus R identity but R times the depolarizing map. Um, and so if we need R greater than zero, that means we need to sort of do some depolarization in order to make everything uh, simplex embeddable. And we're gonna to try to find out what's the smallest number R such that this condition holds. Um, and you can see here in this example, uh, it returns this sigma, which is of course a positive matrix, and it tells us that R is zero. So if, if at this stage, uh, uh, and notice that if I just, Press this, it's going to sort of give me all the output. Um, so uh, this is sort of all automated, and we just see R is equal to zero, which is to say it's completely simplex embeddable. We don't need to add any noise. Uh, uh, and in fact, here's an explicit ontological model. Um, so for each of the four states that we initially started with, or if you want to think about them as these density matrix, and for each effect that we started with, we can represent them as ontic states. Uh, and this is sort of like a mixture or this is sort of an epistemic preparation over four ontic states. So it's uh, everything sort of non-negative here, everything is non-negative here. We just say we call sort of discovery embedding. You can give it uh, your states and your effects, and it will then proceed to sort of compute all the necessary information and tell you whether it's embedding. Uh, and if you look at sort of example three in our in RAM script, this is a case where it's not embeddable, and so you can see an R is equal to one half. And that's how you can understand whether or not the given GPT is or is not some person that Thank you. Ah, no. I just got v one very brief question. It's like if you take very big matrices and stuff like that, probably it scales badly. Um, it, uh, it might. So the, uh, the linear program part is pretty cheap. The business about finding the facets is about the same complexity as finding Bellman equalities. It's kind of the same spirit of giving deterministic strategies to find Bellman equalities. So yeah, if you have uh, a very high dimension uh, and many, many states, uh, it would become complicated. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, Bellman. Thank you, Ellie. Um, thanks, everyone. So um, today I'm going to talk about um, DiscoPy which is a, a library for monoidal categories in Python. Um, thankfully, I planned ahead, so I had a backup, I had backup slides. So, um, so since this GoPy is a library for monoidal categories, um, let's, let's talk about monoidal categories, or at least how they work, what they are and how they work in this GoPy. And um, I'm going to go through what these things mean. And, um, and I think the point of this talk is you don't need to know that much category theory to understand what monoidal categories are. So, so in, in this setting, this GoPy, um, we work with strict monoidal categories. So, so if you've seen these pentagon, triangle, commutative diagrams, they're, they're, everything's equal. We don't, we, and things are not things are not equal up to isomorphism. They're just the same thing, and this lets us compute with things much more efficiently. And uh, in a monoidal category, you have these generating objects called types, 
and generating morphisms called boxes. And um, so you can import types and boxes from DiscoPy and um, you can build types like this. You can have a type A, type B, type C, and they can be tensored together like so with the at symbol. So here is A at B at C. You can also put boxes in parallel um, by tensing them together. So here is a box that has input or domain A and output or codomain B. And this box G has input B and output C. And you can put them together using the tensor operation to get a larger diagram that takes in A tensor B and outputs B tensor C. And um, if your input and output types match across the two boxes, you can even compose them together in a monodal category. So you can have, here's the syntax means F followed by G. And since the input type here and the output types match, you can put them together in a single diagram. And there are some identities as well. There's some units. So you can, you can compose, you have nothing on the left and nothing on the right, and you get the same diagram. And you can put identity wires above and below, and you can still get the same diagram. So, so these axioms are automatically taken care of in, in DiscoPy. It's, it's directly equal. Like if it's isomorphic, you'd have to run some algorithms to convert them. But here we want to be practical, so everything is strict. Um, here's a more practical example. You have a toaster box that takes in bread and heat and outputs toast. And similarly, you have a grill box which takes in toast and cheese and outputs panini. So if you, um, if you put this together, if you have toaster tensored by the cheese identity wire followed by grill, you get, you get the snack process. So you have a toaster, grill. So take, it's, this whole diagram is something that takes in bread, heat, and cheese, and outputs panini. So this is how you can build diagrams practically. What reason with string diagrams at DiscoPy? So if you've, you've seen Bob and Alex's book on, on Patreon quantum processes, that whole book can be typed up into DiscoPy and evaluated. Um, so that was, that's monodal categories in a nutshell. Um, we can also have symmetric monodal categories. And then to do this in the free sense, you just add, you're allowed to have swaps in, the, in, in this category. So we just we import swap. And um, here is swapping heat and bread. And um, this allows you to not only have boxes in parallel, but also swap the wires so you can do more complicated things, such as this more convoluted snack process where shelf gives you bread and cheese. And you have to swap the wires to put them in the right order. Um, this, this, and you can, and you see, I used the snack diagram that I defined earlier on to, to put with the rest of the diagrams to build a larger diagram. So you can combine sub diagrams as well. So, um, yeah. So this is what is known as a symmetric monodal category. So I don't think I've lost anyone so far. Um, so, so you don't need any category theories to use this. Um, another example of a symmetric monodal category is uh, the category of quantum circuits. So, so here is a string diagram. Uh, circuit defined using a string diagram notation. Um, you could still do tensor and compose, but it's in inconvenient. So, so instead we just solve the initial state ket 0, 0, 0, followed by Hadamard's on each qubit, followed by C naughts on each neighboring qubit, and one background. Okay. So now, now more onto the more complicated stuff. So um, we have rigid monodal categories. This is also a free category, so you can build whatever diagram you can build exists in that category. But um, here we add, instead just a, so it's just adding a swap, we also add these cups. And the way to understand these, these cups is that uh, if you have n, n dot r, it means that meaning flows this way. And this one means the meaning flows this way. And the cap, this one flows this way, and it flows this way. And, and if you know about the map state duality, this adding these cups means you can build these diagrams on the left, on the right. So if you had a process that takes A and B, output C, this, this kind of currying process kind of promises, you take an A and you output something, two types that kind of promises, I'll give you C if you give me B later on. Um, and famously, you can do the snake equations. So meaning flows this way, but here meaning flows down and up, and this one down and up, but the other way. And um, this GoPy knows how to remove these snakes automatically using normal form. So, so clearly, we have a grill box and the Ys are all like kind of splurred around here, but, um, and this diagram should be the same as this diagram, but obviously they're not directly equal because they're stored differently. So this GoPy has a normal form on rigid diagrams. So if your, if your cables are all messed up, this GoPy knows how to bring it to a normal form. So once you call normal form and compare, if they were the same diagram up to rewriting, they will be the same, at least for like non-symmetric or at least without swap, like planar diagrams. Um,
there was animation, but this is the backup slides. So no animations. Um, so an example of a rigid category is the category of finite vector spaces where you have cups and caps. So this represents a tensor network of a cup and a cap tensor with some identity wise. And this is equal to just a straight line. And you can test this by just running eval on this tensor network and you see you get the identity matrix. Um, input free, output free. So these, these are dimensions of the vector space. Same with F hill. So, so the objects are, oh, the objects are finite dimensional vector spaces and the morphisms or the boxes are linear maps between them. So here the cap is a bell state and the cup is a bell measurement followed by two post selections plus some renormalizing scalars. So this, when you evaluate this unitary, well, we're not unitary, when you evaluate this, you also get um, the identity. So you know there are snakes, there are cups and caps in the category of cosmos circuits or f -hub. Um So both of those examples, because there are swaps in the category, the rigid structure collapsed to a compact closed structure. But here's an example where the notion of order matters. So in a pre-group diagram, in grammar, you, 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 want to, you want to care about the order in which your words come in. So there's a notion of a left adjoint and a right adjoint. So here um, is a sentence. This is a sentence, and each word has some sort of functional type. And you can tensor them together. So th these are the types of each word. Um, if you add cups, you're going to get a pre-group parse tree like this. Um, and so I've explained quite a few categories already. And now um, I'm going to talk about functors between them. So this is the definition of a functor, um, but in practice, what it does is it replaces every generating type and every generating box with a new type or a new sub diagram. So let me just show you. So this is the by close category. And all I have time to say about a by close category is it allows you to map state duality left and right, but it doesn't have cups and caps. It doesn't collapse to that kind of tensor structure. And it's cups are not, and they don't exist in the by close category. Um, so here's a very similar pass tree to what, what I had before, i.e. Panini. And um, DiscoPy, because all these axioms are already encoded into DiscoPy, it's going to do a search and replace operation on each of the words, but it knows via the match state duality how to collapse these types, which have no tensor products, into separate wires, which have tensor products. So it, these axioms are encoded within DiscoPy. So this is the canonical translation from a categorical grammar into a pregroup grammar. Well, it's another pre -group. And um, the same thing is true of the derivation boxes. These, these, these boxes exist in every by closed category. So this compile automatically, without specifying, knows how to turn these into string diagrams. So when you put it all together, it's going to turn this parse tree into this other parse tree that, that we are familiar with in this GoCat. And um, another example, what you can do is you can take a subcircuit, you can take this pre group diagram and turn it into a quantum circuit by simply replacing each word in the diagram with a sub-circuit. And um, these cups, because we know that um, the category quantum circuits, they have cups and caps. So this GoPy is going to see these cups and automatically put the canonical thing in, which are the, the, the bell measurements followed by post-selection. So um, the only thing I need to specify is what the types and the boxes turn into. So the top bit, I say a sentence. If it's a sentence type, I turn into two qubits. If it's a noun or etc., I turn to a single qubit. And um, later on, this tells me how many qubits the subcircuit of each word has. And I'm just going to apply Hadamard's and CNOTs to every neighboring qubit. And when I put it all together, it's going to look like this. Oh, again. So this circuit has a similar structure to this pass tree. So that's, that's what being functorial means. Um, so very straightforward. But it turns out you can calculate a lot of stuff using this. And in fact, the Lambda presentation we saw earlier, the entire pipeline is more or less a single functor followed by some rewrites. So you can actually do a lot with functors. And um, just to talk about some practical things, with the quantum circuits, we export to lots of different libraries. So we, for example, we export to Ticket, which is a, a quantum compiler. And we also, uh, so very recently, we support Penny Lane. So if you want to do quantum machine learning experiments via DiscoPy, you can do that. Um, his example in ticket. And we also support on the classical side um, tensor libraries. 
So we support Google's tensor network library. So like when you build these tensor networks, it's going to automatically find the most efficient way. Well, not the most efficient way, but one of the efficient ways to contract these diagrams if they exist. Um, so we can also go to ZX. This is also a functor, so it's just a search and replace. And we can go to physics, and physics is going to do rewriting, and you're going to get this diagram. And if you know your ZX, you're going to see this is the superposition of all four, four possible outcomes in the computational basis, which is also what the tensor network tells you here. So, um, in summary, um, well, this is what these are. These are other things this go pipe can do, but um, I haven't got time to talk about it too much. Um, I just want to spend the last bit of the talk thanking everyone who is used and contributed to this go pie. So, um, yeah, thanks. Um, feel free to ask questions. <laughs> Any questions for Richie? Simon? Is there any reason to draw the tensor product in a sequential way? That's a, that's a very good question. So, so, is, so is, there any, is there any reason to draw the tensor product in a sequential way? And also side by side. Here, this example. Exactly. So, so this GoPy technically is a di it stores it not as a monoidal diagram, but as a pre monoidal diagram where the interchanger it's made explicit, so you, you can't directly put them side by side. It has to be different order. So that, that's a design choice in this GoPy. And the reason for this is this kind of like leaves less things with this GoPy to think about. So like when you draw this, this explicitly means you tensoring the F box with the identity wire composed with the wire tensor of the box. So the computation is more explicit like um, in, in many scenarios. So like when you, for example, like there's a, as a, as a proof of concept, there's a, we use sensor networks now, but you can, directly send this as a functor to a tensor category, and it's automatically going to evaluate the diagram in that order that is specified in the diagram. But if you had it side by side, there's kind of some ambiguity for the functor to work out. It's like some, some design, some freedoms. Yeah, there's this uh, conservativity result of multiplicative linear logic over intuitionistic logic, where you can like interpret uh, monoidal closed categories uh, as like uh, the string diagrams in star autonomous Categories which have like cups and caps. Have you thought about like, you know, if you could draw this, draw like the. Can I can I collapse this to have cups and caps kind of a bit more like yeah, it shows but, it, but, more. but more more restricted type like instead of the compact closed ones like where the type system is a bit different. So is this a, like a free, free feature suggestion or is it something that I, like I can like, do like for by closed? Like yeah, why uh, why can't you just draw cups and caps like? Um, I've choose? seen, I don't know exactly what you suggested, but I've seen some calculi where for bi closed categories where you kind of draw cups and caps in a circle in a bubble, and that kind of shows the cups and caps. And uh, um, we haven't implemented that, and um, I think in practice it might be a bit tricky. But, but mm. Thanks for the question. Uh, I know what Cole is saying, so I can explain another time. Okay. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Maybe this is a bit related to what Cole was saying, but so everything you're showing here is st string diagrams, so just one tensor product. Do you think there's any way to expand this to some kind of more proofnet-like settings where there's more than one tensor? Yeah, maybe. I think that's the answer, probably. Yeah, yeah. That's if that, that that was the question. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. We thank Richie again, and we move on to. Okay, so um, let me start by thanking the organizers for putting together uh, such a really nice in-person uh, QPL edition. And in particular, I want to thank Stefano and Matti for um, the opportunity to give a two-part uh, tool presentation on Kermit. So Kermit is a soft, open source software package to perform error mitigation uh, in a composable way. So uh, we've shuffled the schedule a little bit so, so that in this part, first part, I can uh, give you an introduction to um, um, how to deal with errors in this NISC regime, and as well as uh, giving you some uh, hardware results on benchmarking error mitigation methods. And you can find a lot more uh, um, results uh, in this preprint with Silas, Dan, Seon, and, uh, and Ross. 
So basically, this first part of the talk is what you can do with Kermit. And in the second part, Silas will give a, a remote presentation of how to do it and uh, what lies under the hood in terms of uh, software design of Kermit. OK, so um, current and sort of near term quantum devices uh, cannot uh, run full tolerant com quantum computation. So if you're running a circuit or a quantum algorithm on NISC devices, sooner or later, you're going to um, have to deal with noise. There's no way around it, really. But there are um, several t techniques that you can apply um, to suppress errors and mitigate errors. And you can tackle the problem at each layer in the, um, in the quantum stack. So starting from hardware, where you can uh, improve the gate fidelities or, or um, enhance the coherence time using optimal control and compensating pulses. Moving on to circuit level, where if, for example, you uh, optimize your circuit decompositions into native gates, uh, so that you have um, fewer noise components that would also improve the fidelity of your um, state preparation, as well as um, methods that aim to tailor uh, one type of noise into a different type of noise. Um, you can also uh, deal with um, noise in the NISC regime at le uh, the application level, where m many algorithms in, um, aim to compute the expectation value of some observable. So unlike the previous layers, these types of error mitigation method don't necessarily produce a better uh, a fidelity, a, a state that has higher fidelity, but rather aim to reduce the approximation error in the quantity of interest, for example, an expectation value, via some uh, additional um, measurements and classical post-processing. So there have been many proposals for how to perform these types of, let's call them heuristic methods to deal with errors. And many of them fall into this sort of similar, similar framework. So I'm going to focus, so um, we're going to focus next on uh, error mitigation for observables. But first, let me tell you that Kermit itself um, uh, acts uh, on digitized information. So it acts at the circuit and also application level, and you can find uh, the GitHub repo, and you'll hear more about it in the, sec in the second part um, um, given by Silas. All right, so uh, how um, does error mitigation for observable work? So you have an input observable and um, some unitary circuit, and the goal is to uh, have an estimate of, an, of the expectation value of the obser observable with respect to some um, state. Uh, sub, some state. Um, now, if you're running things on a, back a quantum backend, um, you're going to have to deal with finite sampling. So basically, your output is going to be a sample mean estimator. Uh, and that will have a variance that scales inversely proportional with the number of shots. Um, in addition to that, uh, the uh, sort of if you have physical noise, the distribution itself is going gonna, is gonna to shift away from um, the, idea, the ideal value. Now, the um, aim for error mitigation methods is to produce an estimator um, that is typically a function of various noisy outputs that produces a, um, a, a, an imp improved approximation, so it's closer, the, the value is closer to the ideal uh, expectation value at the expense of having an increased variance. So in order to get the same accuracy with error mitigation method as you, as you'd have with uh, noisy computations, um, you would need to pay the price of an increased sampling complexity. Okay, so how do you produce these, um, these estimators? So as I, as I said, many error mitigation methods um, that work in the NISC the, they work in the NISC regime and, and have a, a sort of modular, um, modular structure. So you can sort of split them up into uh, three different steps. Uh, you have a sort of data collection step where you um, produce a series of processes labeled by S. And um, 
these processors are, are a little bit like, uh, like circuit boards. So they modify um, a circuit or, um, or a gate in a, in a very particular way. And the aim is to compute expectation values of either the input observable of, or some modified observables. Um, and you estimate that depending on your method, either on a quantum backend or some simulator, if, if that computation can be done on a simulator. And the second step um, is uh, sort of to relate this, these outputs via a functional model. So this is typically motivated by uh, particular noise models that you think might be a good approximation of what's going on in your device. So you can, so depending on that, you would have different functional models to, to fit to. And the, se the, the final step is to produce um, this, est this error mitigated estimator from the functional fit using the data that you've collected by running on, on backends, given some fixed set of resources. That those could be the total number of counts, the number of circuits, or uh, total number of classical compute time. If, uh, so if you're free to sort of choose your, the setup of your framework. Okay, so let's look at a, an example of a, a method that's quite uh, quite common, and it's been developed uh, sort of at, at the same time by two, two different groups. So this is their zero noise extrapolation, and it relies on the idea that, uh, well, you, can, you cannot de decrease the level of noise, but you can find ways of, of increasing it at, at, um, by sort of introducing um, identity insertions. So you, you sort of compute expectation values at a scaled at various levels of where the noise has been scaled, and then you extrapolate back to, to, the, to, a, zero level, to, to a zero level to um, produce a, an error mitigated estimator. So one way of doing that in, in this context of digitized um, uh, error mitigation is, like I said, by um, having a series of processes that uh, modify your, your input circuit or particular gate by applying identity insertions. And by that I mean you apply the same unitary and its inverse some number of times. And the number of identity insertions can act as a, you know, as a, pro as a proxy for the noise level. Um, and this analogy makes, makes sense if you look at very simplified uh, depolarizing type of, of noise model. So um, working, for, so that gives you an idea of how looking at the different types of noise models, like depolarizing noise model or uh, sort of incoherent um, type of errors, uh, you can come up with um, uh, different, uh, different functional models. So uh, you have here two examples of using an exponential or, or pol polynomial fit. And then the error mitigated ops, uh, you know, output is going to be one of the, these fit parameters that you've obtained via some sort of classical op optimization that may also take into account finite sampling as well. All right, so um, there are many other methods and Kermit can, uh, can perform several, several different methods for performing, for doing error mitigation. Um, but what I want to show you next is um, some results on hardware of how, how these methods actually work. So for that, uh, we uh, run um, zero noise extrapolation and look at how much the um, approximation error in the noisy expectation value um, has been decreased by applying the error mitigation method. So if error mitigation has been successful, this value is going to be between zero and one, but since these are typically heuristic methods, sometimes you will find that error mitigation doesn't help at all. So we, can, we look at the, so in these types of experiments, we look at sort of global observables. Uh, so in, in the particular, in this case, it, it's a Pauli Z acting on every single qubit. And we sample um, random circuits of various number of qubits and depth. depth. So, um, and we look at, so we sort of display this in the, this type of volumetric, plots volumetric framework. Uh, where for each, for varying levels of uh, depth and qubit number, we look at uh, sampling, um, in this case it was five random circuits, uh, and looking at the mean relative mitigation error on um, the outer boxes, 
And the inner boxes is displaying the worst case um, uh, error. And now on your left, you see uh, the um, results from a Casablanca device and on your left from Legos. So these look very different in terms of the performance, although if you look at the, archi the, so the, the architecture of the two devices is the same and the calibration data taken at the time of the experiment is quite similar. So, and of course we use the same, the same, um, the same circuit sets and the same shot budget and the same compilation strategy in both of these cases. Um, so what can, so, so what's going on here? So basically the idea is that, uh, you know, you, you can have a variable performance depending on your device. And one thing that could explain this is the fact that the profile of the noise is, is not really Suited, suited to the assumption that comes into the method. So, for example, scale, the way you're introducing scaling up noise in these two different devices works differently because the, the, the type of noise it's, it could be different itself. And you can't see that from the calibration da data because that's a coarse, coarse information about the errors in the device. So, one way of trying to work around this is to try and combine different methods. So. A strategy would be to uh, combine zero noise extrapolation with methods that aim to, to tailor uh, um, one type of noise into a different type of noise. So in this case, since zero noise extrapolation works well with incoherent depolarizing uh, type of noise, uh, methods like frame randomization, which aims to, um, via sort of randomizing over, over the Pauli group, aims to convert coherent errors into Pauli, so stochastic errors. These could, could in principle, be used to uh, make sure that the noise profile matches closer to the assumptions in these heuristic, heuristic methods. And um, just to flag out that many, many works, recent works have looked into this, and in particular, um, they've managed to get good results in the sense of getting approximation errors that are compatible, are sort of on the similar level uh, with uh, um, leading tensor network uh, classical simulations for the problem of sort of computing properties of a dynamically evolved state. Okay, so this is something that Kermit can do because it's meant to be compositional. Um, and I guess, I guess this is a good place for me to stop and hand it over to, to, to Silas eventually, who will, who will um, sort of give you a demo on how, how this can be done within Kermit. So I'm happy to take any questions uh, before um, sort of Silas jumps in on, on the screen from, I guess, London. Okay. Any questions for Christina? John? I have a silly question. Okay. Uh, is, it, is, this, is this picture of Kermit generated by like an AI or something? Or by oh, like I forgot to, I, I, I actually forgot to say this. I, I was, I meant to say that this is not an official logo, so don't quote me and don't tell anybody that I showed you this. <laughs> okay, yes. No, so those experiments did not use randomized compiling. Uh, we are aiming to find out uh, in future work, uh, but uh, so the, 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 the experiments that IBM ran that I, I mentioned, so we have in one of these references here, uh, um, yeah, it, it, they, sh they show you that using things like not only just frame randomization, but other sort of uh, lower level techniques, um, um, like dynamical decoupling helps in terms of um, producing better, better, better error mitigated expectation values. Okay, so we thank Christina again. Thank you. Just a little bit of admin before I get into it, which is that, as Christina said, our docs are, are hosted at kerm.it, and that if you are following along with this presentation, the only two packages you should need to install are Kermit and PyTicketKiskit, and everything should just work. Um, 
Cool. So Christina did mention what Kermit is, but I just wanted to say it in my own words. Uh, so Kermit is a Python package we created uh, for automatically running error mitigated experiments and principally to make that super accessible. Uh, it's open source. It supports any PyTicket backend, uh, including all the common hardware providers you can think of, such as Qiskit and Continuum. Um, if you don't know what PyTicket is, it is a quantum software development kit uh, we produce at Cambridge Quantum, and there is a link there you can follow. Um, and then it's supposed to make er running error mitigation schemes as easy as just running any experiments. Um, it's supposed to make constructing new error mitigation schemes easy, and it's supposed to provide customizable composition mm -hmm. schemes. Now, these last two are the kind of two main design points uh, kind of educating what we wanted to do. Any error mitigation package, which is worth anything, should probably do the first four, and these last two are maybe the kind of more unique selling point for Kermit. Uh, if these bullet points don't intrigue you, then you're probably not going to like what I'm about to talk about. But hopefully, if you're interested in error mitigation, then it's interesting. OK, so to start with then, uh, we're going to start from what is our kind of atomic unit in Kermit, which is what we call a MIT task object. Um, a MIT task object is this little green square here. And we'll talk about what the uh, outer bits are in a moment. Um, it is. A, a Python object, which is defined by four things, a method that does something of interest. And so for now, we'll keep that to, we can run this circuit on this backend if we pass it to this method. Um, a number of in and out wires, which are used for constructing larger graphs. We'll see this in a second. And also some unique label. Uh, and so every time we build a Kermit uh, graph, and we'll look at these graphs in a second, we need to construct these MIT task objects to build them from. And the kind of standardized way we do this in Kermit is via generator functions. So building up from the very bottom, uh, what I've got here is an example generator function for a MIT task object. Uh, it's called run circuit task gen uh, in keeping with the graph I just showed you, which is just down here. Uh, we can pass it any PyTicket backend. This is important to remember, simulator or hardware. And it's going to return a MIT task object where we don't need to worry too much about this code here, but it's going to run some circuits on some backend and give some results to you. Uh, the important bit here is probably what these types are. So list of circuit shots. Some of you can probably guess what this means, uh, but a circuit shot is a named tuple uh, with two entries, a PyTicket quantum circuit, and an integer referring to the number of shots you want to take of it on some hardware. For people who have never run something on a quantum computer, this is typically how it works. You say to the provider, I've got this circuit, I want X shots of it. And then they return you the X shots. And for us in PyTicket, we use this backend result object to capture this. And that's what's going on here. So the MIT task object has a callable, which does a function which transforms a list of circuit shots to a list of backend result. Uh, and so we can see how this works. We can make a, a, a simple CX circuit, say, and uh, we can create this MIT task object. As I said, we can do it for any backend. So I'm creating here a uh, noisy simulator where the noise model is supposed to be somewhere close to what the IBM Q Keto device does, provided by IBM Q. And that's what this Keto backend object is here. We can pass it to this generator function I just showed you for creating our MIT task object. And then uh, as a really basic building block, it still has a callable, so we could pass it this circuit, C, and a number of shots, 20, uh, through to it, and we get some counts back. Some of you may have noticed this is passing a tuple. This is because what we're looking at here is a building block of uh, the whole of Kermit, not the um, how we actually use Kermit. So soon you'll see we get rid of this. So that's our basic building block. And we use these building blocks to make something what we call a task graph. Um, and so this is a, a Kermit Python class. Uh, and it has kind of a few main attributes. The first thing is the task graph itself. Uh, this is some network X multi -die graph, uh, which gives us the dependency between MIT task objects. You're going to see absolutely loads of these by the end of the presentation. So if that sounds confusing, just wait. Um, and it also has a basic local runtime. Uh, so you'll have some graph. And I mean, we can think about the graph we just saw with that single task. It is a topological sort on all these nodes runs the MIT task in that graph in order. Uh, and it does this by getting uh, a single vertex will have some input edges. The data on those input edges is passed to the function it holds. 
and the output information that function gives you is reassigned to the graph edges. And that's done repeatedly until the whole graph, all the vertices have been looked at. And then we've got two methods for extending our task graphs. Uh, appending tasks to the back of the graph and prepending tasks to the front, which is all going to make a lot more sense now. So what can we do? We can from Kermit import this task graph, this task graph uh, Python class, and we can create one. In its most basic sense, this is not doing error mitigation. It's doing nothing of interest. It has two vertices, an input vertex and an output vertex. And so if we were to say run on this task graph, uh, it has no uh, no typing. You can pass it anything and it'll spit anything out, which is pretty boring, but is where we, we kind of start to build things up. But what can we do? We can add the mit task we just made to the task graph like so. So we just append it on. And now suddenly we've got a slightly more interesting graph and you'll notice it's the graph uh, we looked at before. And now if we run something through this, first of all, these uh, edges have now got some implicit typing information. Run circuits expects a list of circuit shots. And so uh, when we call run, it expects to take that. And we then expect to receive a list of back and result. And that's because this task we had here Silence. did that transformation. Yeah, Silence. go for it. Uh, yeah. can, can you make the... Ross asks to make text bigger. The text if bigger. You can. If you can. Uh, I can. Does anybody know how to do that? I can try and zoom in on my uh, screen if that helps. Yes. All right. Do you want to tell me when to uh, stop? Stop. Okay. Cool. All right. The uh, <laughs> the slide size is going to be all off, but we'll uh, we'll work around that. Uh, uh, what is the command for it actually? Okay, cool. We'll do some control plus and minus thing. Okay, so we run something, we get some results. This is more interesting than doing nothing. But what we've actually produced here is something of actual interest. And this is the first instance of Kermit being a useful thing for running experiments and running uh, uh, mitigation of things, which is we produce what a mit res object is. And so this is one of two experimental archetypes we uh, support in Kermit. Uh, and it is exactly like a task graph, except from it has one additional constraint, which is that when we call the run function, it must always be given a list of circuit shots, and it must always return a list of backend results. And this then implies extra constraints on how we can construct larger task graphs. So the append method must be given mit tasks, which receive and return list of backend result. If it didn't, then it would change what the run function does. And the prepend task must receive tasks that receive and return list of circuit shots. Uh, and this is a, a core information for being able to do composability later. Um, and let's have a look then. So we've actually already essentially created what a mit res uh, task does. Uh, but we can have a look at it here. So from Kermit, we can import mit res. And this is what we've got here, mit res equals mit res, we pass it the same backend. Uh, and we can have a look at what the graph here is going to do. Uh, it's slightly different to what we had before, and that's because it breaks up the component steps into two tasks. But uh, we can reason about it the same way. Circus the handles takes in a list of circuit shots. It passes them a backend. In PyTicket, this returns a list of handles, which are unique identifiers. We can send back to the backend to get our results or our shots. And so that's what this graph is doing. And then similarly, uh, we can also add new tasks to this graph. Uh, I'm assuming the writing is quite small. You're not quite going to see what the code is going on here, but I'll explain it, which is that in the same pattern as the generator function before, this here produces a mit task object that now compiles your circuits, uh, which is a pretty crucial step whenever you're running experiments. Uh, and what is important to note is that it receives a list of circuit shots and it returns a list of circuit shots. And this means it respects the typing of a mit res and thus we can add it to our mit res task graph. And so here we go. Uh, we add it like so, very straightforward. And now we get a task graph. I should say that all the images I've been using are just auto -gener generated from Kermit. So it's easy to see what you're doing. And we produce something which is slightly more interesting. Um, so this is, so we've gone from uh, the atomic unit, which is our MIT task, to 
are graphs which are comprised of these different MIT tiles with dependencies. The dependencies here are given top to bottom. Uh, but obviously, we want Kermit to do error, error mitigation. Uh, sorry, I should just very quickly say that we can then uh, run our MIT res objects uh, as before. We can create a circuit. Uh, we can create a mini experiment of this circuit with 2,000 shots. And we just call the run method with that, and it returns some counts. Um, so this is compiling that circuit and running it, uh, which is an easy interface. But as I said, we want to do actual error mitigation. So what Kermit also provides is generator functions to produce these MIT res objects that actually do error mitigation. So Christina mentioned frame randomization a second ago. And from Kermit.frame randomization, we can import a generator function that, when called, produces a task graph that automatically runs a frame randomization scheme. Uh, you can see here we pass it a back end, and we pass the number of frame randomization circuits we want to produce. And we can have a little look at the graph here, which is something like this. Uh, and so we can see before we had a uh, graph which uh, kind of sent our circuits to the back end to get handles. It got results from those handles, and it also compiled it. Now we've got a couple of tasks either side, one which produced our frame randomization circuits, and one that uh, for the individual back end results these circuits have, combines them into a uh, single back end result object. And the reason we do that then, oh, so very quickly, uh, note that these graphs are generated on function call. And essentially what Kermit has is a blueprint for constructing them. So what's going on here is we produce some MIT res objects, uh, say this, or if the user provides one already, we just build around it. And then we add a compilation task, the circuit creation task, and the result task like so around it to do the procedure. And then what this really means is that as a user, you have the same interface for doing it. So now as before, we have our circuit wire. It's this uh, bell pair circuit with 2000 shots. Uh, we pass it to our MIT res via the run arguments and uh, we get back some results. And uh, here for the given noise model, frame randomization doesn't seem to be doing much, but maybe the most important bit is that it was just as easy to run the experiment with frame randomization as it was to not. So if you expect it to improve results, you may as well just do it. And then the final uh, kind of experimental archetype uh, Kermit helps with is ones in which you uh, want to estimate the um, expectation value of some observable as Christina introduced. Similarly to MIT-RES, all this really adds is additional constraints to the run function. So uh, we package all the information for observing, uh, for estimating this expectation variable into a type called observable experiment. Um, it's detailed a lot in the manual what the components of this are, so we're not going to dive into it today. Um, and it returns a, a, a Python object, which for each of the terms in your operator, gives you the estimated coefficient. And so like with MIT res, this gives additional constraints to what append and prepend can do. Um, and so like with MIT res, then we can import a MIT X, we can pass it a backend to get a, a task graph object. And in this case, our task graph is something like this. Uh, filter observable tracker produces measurement circuits from an ANSAT circuit and whatever the operator you want to measure is. Um, they all get run through some MIT res object, and some of you will be realizing this can be any MIT res object, including one that's doing error mitigation. And then at the end, we generate um, our expectation values for all of them. These two tasks here are just to try and reduce the number of calls you make to your hardware provider. And so for the, the final few slides, we're going to just do a few comparisons using our MIT X for a kind of a very basic circuit. It's a single party exponential. And we are setting up this experiment, so the expectation value should always be 1.0, just for um, illustrative purposes. So we won't delve too much into the type here, but you'll see we've got this observable experiment object here. It's got your ANSAT circuit, which is a circuit, the number of shots, and if you're using symbolic substitution, your symbols. And it's got an operator, which is just a ZZZ term over all the qubits. And so this should always have expectation value 1. And we find that if we run it through our noise model MITEX, uh, that we return the value 0.8458. And let's see if we can improve that then. As with MIT-RES, we have uh, 
methods that also generate a mitex task graph. So we talked about zero knowledge extrapolation before with Christina. This method here will automatically uh, produce a task graph for doing so. It looks a bit like this. So you can see they start to become more involved as the method becomes more complicated, but it is auto-generated. And uh, as before with mythics.run, once you know how to define an experiment, you just pass it through to run. So it was in this case fairly trivial to now run our estimation of the expectation value of some observable with zero noise extrapolation at the same time and get new results. And we've also got an infilt, um, inbuilt graph shower displayer. And this changes the value slightly. But we're not going to worry about that yet because to end off we're going to talk about combining schemes and then we'll see more interesting results so just to state what's on the screen here uh, task graphs for running error mitigation schemes are constructed on call via that blueprint which i showed you with the frame randomization case uh, each construction builds around a mit res or mitx object and so via optional arguments, a custom mit res or mitx object can be passed to the generator to construct the task graph around um, which allows us to do this um, customizable composition. And then there's an additional rule, which is that MITRES schemes can be built around MITRES objects, and MITX schemes can be built around MITRES or MITX objects. And then let's just do a few things like this. Well, I didn't show it earlier, but there is an, an, an auto generated task graph for spam correction. So we could call that like so. And we can pass it via a keyword argument the frame randomization MITRES we produced earlier. And then just with the other MIT res, we can run it with our bell pair circuit and we can get some counts. And these counts are looking a lot better than we had earlier for the noise model. And so this will also generate a graph that looks a little bit like this. So we can see our frame randomization task graph here and the spam bits all around it. So Lars, we're running a little bit over time. That's OK. Sorry about that. Maybe another minute and then we'll be done. Um, we can do the same with a mitex object, so we can pass that spam and frame randomization mit res through to mitex and get some results, which are improved. Uh, and this gives another graph. And we can do the same for ZNE. So here we're doing ZNE spam and frame randomization, and we can see for the uh, noise model at least the actual value is 1.0. Without uh, error mitigation, we start with 0.867, and by adding some methods, we get 1.005, which is better. There's a lot of different parameters at play here, so you shouldn't read too much into it. And then just to finish off, I thought I'd run something on a real device. So this is done on IBM Perth. And just to show making the mitex with a real device is just as easy. You just pass it through. And then I run it on the same schemes. And we find that on the real device, uh, using frame randomization spam and ZNE, we can improve the result from 0.821 to 1.060. So this is all very specific, but it shows that it is doing something, and maybe you can get good results. And uh, that's all I wanted to talk about. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> maybe one. Maybe one question. Huh? Do you have a question? Um, so just a quick question on the on our clarification. So what is the use case that Kermit is designed for? Is it in, so in particular is it Kermit designed for users to uh, define their own error mitigation strategies or use the ones that are already provided? It's designed for both. So in theory, when you're designing an error mitigation scheme, a lot of it is just piping and plumbing information around. And this graph structure is supposed to make it easier to read them out there. And there's also a lot of code for basic things like running your experiments through a circuit that are already pre-written. Um, so it's supposed to make it easier to design that. But then, of course, as I say, we've also got pre-generated graphs. So if you just want to try it out, you can just call one of them and run it. OK. Thank you, so, Silas and Christina and Ross and everybody else. So next, we have Christian. Who's going to talk about Quinflation, is that the pronunciation or quinflation? Q inflation. Okay, Q inflation. But it's not the final name. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Christian, I'm from ICFO, from Barcelona. And together with Alex, uh, who's in Madrid, we developed a Python package, which I'll read out what it does. It assesses compatibility of observations with arbitrary causal structures with classical or quantum latent <coughs> variables. It's quite long, but 
it's very descriptive. So if you understood that, then you know everything. But if you didn't understand everything, then I will just explain it. So I'll explain a bit about causal structures. Then I'll explain how you test compatibility. Then I will not do a live demonstration, but I'll show some code snippets. And then I'll finish off with some, some comments. OK, so I'll start with, uh, oh, I forgot to mention this, because I also forgot to add it to the slide. Like Alex, uh, Alex's affiliation is ICMAT in Madrid. I guess that's also important to have it be known. So I'll start with the standard belt scenario. I kind of assume most of you know something about this, so I'll go over it quickly. We have two laboratories which are space-like separated. You can say Alice is in one and Bob is in the other, and they have some shared system between them, and they're doing some measurements on it, and they have some different choices for the measurements, different settings, and I label these as X and Y, and given this, this choice, they do their measurements and then they get some outputs. And these outputs, I lab label them as A and B. And then we can think of different ways to model or try to think of causal explanations of the statistics that you get, like P of AB given XY is the statistics of the experiment. One is that of a local hidden variable description, which I'll not explain in detail, but it's just this decomposition. Then we can also think of quantum correlations. So you have a shared quantum state and you do some measurements. So A sub XA. Can you? No, you cannot see the pointer. I guess it's useful to point. Ah, it's fine. I, I'll just describe it with words. So then they do these A sub A or B sub YB projective measurements or POVMs on, on their systems. And we can also think of the most general physically allowed correlations possible, which are just those that uh, don't allow for communication between the two labs. So I also have to say that I come from a non-locality background, so I write things with the boxes on the left. But if you know more uh, Bayesian directed acyclic graphs, then you can also write it like that. So everything I write in the slides can be converted into this other form. So in this Bell scenario, we have we can write an oracle that tells you if something has a local hidden variable description or not with a linear program. The same for the non signaling set. And for the question of whether some correlations are realizable with a quantum model, there are techniques. You cannot get a yes, but there are, te there are techniques that tell you when you cannot. I will actually explain this in a bit more detail during this talk. Okay, so this is, the, this is basically to set the language and the notation. What I'm more interested in is, is networks. So when we go to networks, so for the rest of the talk, I'll only focus on networks with quantum sources of correlations. So I just remove the other two. And then when I say networks, I mean that you have more than two boxes and the sources are distributed in a certain way and they're statistically independent. So that's the important uh, concept that we need to know. So more formally, when I can have a distribution, P, A, B, C, given X, Y, Z, and I can ask, similarly to the standard belt scenario, if there exist measurements A, B, C, and states rho A, B, rho B, C, such that you can simulate your correlations with this, with Born's rule. Oh, yes, and some intuition about what this can mean is maybe measuring some systems that never interacted in the past. So... This in the yellow box is the main question that I want to answer. And for the standard case, we have some, some techniques, which I'll explain more. And then for the, net, for the network case, the difficulty comes from this independent, independence assumption. And it's difficult because it makes the problem non-convex. So that's the main difficulty. But there are techniques to deal with this, uh, and it's called quantum inflation, which is a modification of NPA. So I'll explain now uh, what this consists of. So I'll, I'll just give the intuition. If you want to read the full paper, it's here. Uh, this was released, I think, two years ago, on archive two years ago, and then it was published last year. Um, OK, so we have this network. And the main idea 
about quantum inflation is that you can go to a so-called inflated graph where you have copies of your quantum sources. And on this inflated graph, it's easier to impose some constraints, namely the factorization constraint. So now in this inflated graph, uh, in the standard scenario, we had the A, B, C measurements. So now we have the same, but we get these extra indices, like A1, A2, which represent on which quantum state you are measuring. I hope that's clear. So B, 1, 2 would be on the left, B is measuring row 1 of AB, and on the right, he's measuring row 2 of BC. And then we can... So instead of writing Born's rule completely, I'll just use this bracket notation. And this would be an expected value of some observable. Um, OK. So it's a bit dense, but the main thing I want to say is that when you go to an inflated graph, these indices indicate the support of the different operators. And when there is not overlapping support, you get factorizations. So this is a new thing on the inflated graph. So this expected value factorizes into two products of expected values. And then, well, there's another example. So then you have the yellow, orange, and green that like overlap. And then you have the blue and pink that overlap. But these two don't overlap, so then they factorize. This is the key thing you need to know about this technique. You don't need to know more to use the package. Actually, you don't even need to know this to use the package. This is more extra, extra information. OK, but why care about these moments? So the reason to care about these moments is because they appear in the NPA technique. So I will also maybe not explain in full detail, but the idea is that given this list of measurement operators that we have in quantum theory, you can just take a set of them a uh, generating set of, of, let's say, monomials of these measurement operators. And you can build a big matrix, which you know that if your correlations come from quantum mechanics, it needs to be positive semi-definite. So this will look a bit ugly, but the intuition is just that. You can build a matrix, which you, need, you know needs to be positive. And in this matrix, I, I colored like all the entries which you know. So you know the probability, so you know that all these are just numbers in the end. But some of these are not known, because they might correspond to measuring incompatible observables. So you don't know how to assign a probability to them. Probability to them. So these are empty uh, entries in the moment matrix. But you know that if quantum theory is correct, or if it simulates your distribution, there needs to exist some numbers such that this matrix is positive semi-definite. So maybe everything I said until now is not very important, but the yellow box is the important thing you need to know. OK, so just a small comment that the factorizations come because the entries of this moment matrix are expected values of operators. So then when you do this on the inflated graph, they factorize. And if you don't do these factorizations, you're basically just doing a test with a global shared state. And if you impose these factorizations, then you're actually testing the specific network that you have in mind. So the other key intuition is that this non-convex independence constraint on the quantum state gets relaxed to constraints on a convex program, program, an SDP. So in the end, what you're going to do is run this SDP, and this will be a relaxation of this constraint. So uh, well, I didn't prove to you, but I told you that if um, if the probability vector is compatible with my network, then this big matrix should be fillable with numbers such that it's positive semi-definite. And if you do the contrapositive, then if you cannot find these numbers, then you know that your probability is not compatible with the quantum network. And basically, that's it. That's all you need to know. So what does the Python package do? So what it does is just do all of this for you, so you don't have to do it. So what it takes as input is you just encode the the network structure. So you see the first parameter is just DAG, which stands for the network. This is the same network that I used for the example. Then you give some cardinality for X, Y, Z, and A, B, C. And then you specify how many copies of the sources you take, in this case, two and two. Then when you call generate relaxation, the third line, 
basically that tells you what set of monomials they want to take. So as a user, I gave you an ex a specific example of monomials, but as a user, you don't really need to care about that. You just increase that number there, you go from NPA2 to NPA3, and they get a tighter set of constraints. So as a user, you just give the network, you give more or less the level of relaxation that you want, and then you can just input your distribution, you call solve, and then that's it. Then you get um, the status of the SDP, if it's feasible or infeasible. And if it's infeasible, you can also extract the certificate that tells you analytically that your distribution is incompatible. And you can also use it for other distributions without needing to run the SDP again. And you can also do optimization of things over the relaxation and more details. But the main thing is that you shouldn't need to care too much about what goes, what happens behind the curtains. So now a bit of a bird's eye view of um, all of this, these networks. So in the standard scenario, I introduced the idea of the local set, quantum set, and no link set. If you go to networks, you can also think of compatibility with networks with classical shared randomness, with quantum sources, or also with more general non-signaling resources. So each of these have a corresponding inflation technique, which does something similar to what I said. So what we implemented first is quantum inflation because it's the most versatile of all three, in that if you take quantum inflation and you make everything commute, you get a relaxation of classical inflation. But it's not binary, you can also go in between. So you could also have hybrid sources, one quantum and one classical. You could also impose that some measurements should be separable or entangled, entangling. So it's nice that you can go full quantum. You cannot go as tight as classical inflation, but you get a good relaxation of classical inflation by making everything commute. But you can also go somewhere in between. So it's quite flex flexible in this sense. And, well, this is, yeah, so I think I, I was looking over the other talks and ours is, not, is the only one that's not released yet. So we were planning to have it released by the time of the conference, but... So we could release it, but we thought it would be actually better to add the things we're almost done with adding before making the public release, which will come with an archive paper. So, uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense to discuss all these list of features. I think that's, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, no. Thanks a lot for the, for the talk. Um, do you have any plans to take into account symmetries in the situations to to aid in the in the SDP or in the inflations? So we do that in the sense that we use symmetries to reduce the number of variables mm -hmm. of these unknown things you can fill out, but it's quite technically complex to block diagonalize the moment matrix. So that would be a very nice thing to do. So there are ways to do it. Um, there's a mathematical, uh, there's a MATLAB tool called REPLAB, so you can just put the symmetries and it diagonalizes it for you. But it doesn't help with scalability. It might help if you want to do a bisection and then you run each program quicker, but it doesn't help you solve problems you couldn't solve without implementing it. Does that make sense? Mm, yes, I'm not quite sure why, because in my experience it does help a bit. Okay, we can talk later. But So underneath the hood, are you basing this on CVXPy or what do you... Um, using to solve the... So, CVXPy, when we tried to do large problems, it turned out to be a bit, use more RAM than yeah. other methods, so we wrote it in Mosaic, and then we wrote okay. the dual by hand, so that's, fa that doesn't use as much RAM, okay. so that's... But so it's directly tied to Mosaic, you can't change your solvers or... You can, well, you can do it in CVXPy, but then it has this, maybe RAM issue. Okay, but your tool... So we give the to option to export it to CVXPy. Okay. Or Picos. Okay. Thanks. Or just in a text file, which you can load with something else. Okay, thanks. Uh, any more questions here? Uh, as a brief question, was this 
was this driven by a particular goal you needed it for to basically go via standard techniques? As in why we did this? Yeah, it was it some big project you wanted to do? And then... uh, well, we developed these codes for some other project, and once that was done, we thought it would be nice to just make it more user-friendly. And... Okay, thank you. We thank Christian again.